Welcome back to Harbor Unboxed. So, Intel 5th Gen versus 10th Gen. Why, you might be asking yourself. Uh, no real reason, to be perfectly honest, apart from the fact that any time I talk about Intel CPU design and architecture, there are a band of commenters who demand I revisit Broadwell DT. So, parts like the Core i7-5775C. But before I do, Today's video sponsor is Gigabyte and their brand new range of AMD X570S motherboards and Radeon RX 6600 XT graphics cards. Gigabyte offers an excellent range of X570S desktop motherboards equipped with robust VRM designs capable of extracting the most from AMD's Ryzen 9 processors. Then for gamers, they have some shiny new 6600 XT graphics cards such as the Gaming OC model that we looked at recently, featuring a large WinForce 3X cooler. So for more information, please check the links in the video description. Now, you'd be forgiven if you had no idea Intel even had a fifth generation mainstream desktop processor range. And that's because it consisted of just two socketed parts, and neither of them were on sale for particularly long, despite being some of Intel's most interesting CPUs that they'd released in years. In fact, Broadwell was kind of a big deal as it ushered in Intel's now, uh, well, how should I put it? Infamous 14 nanometer process. Okay, so in mid-2015, Intel's new and very cutting-edge 14 nanometer process was a big deal. We just didn't expect that they'd be still relying on it six years later with their 11th generation of core series processors. Even the 14 nanometer process had its issues and was actually quite heavily delayed. Well, not 10 nanometer heavily delayed, but it was delayed. And as a result, Broadwell arrived much later than expected, forcing Intel to refresh Haswell a year after release, and it would still be another full year before 14 nanometer Broadwell would arrive. But it would be short-lived, incredibly just two months, I repeat, just two months after the release of the Broadwell chip such as the Core i7-5775C and Core i5-5675C, both parts were essentially discontinued as Intel moved on with Skylake S, pumping out a full range of 14 nanometer Core i7, Core i5, Core i3, Pentium, and even Celeron processors. Skylake also saw the transition to DDR4, while Broadwell parts were limited to DDR3 on the Z97 platform. So, in a way, I think it is fair to say that Broadwell DT was a failure, leaving the ultra expensive Broadwell E parts to push the Intel HEDT agenda forward. But, in my opinion, Broadwell DT was much more interesting than Broadwell E, despite being limited to just four cores, while parts like the Core i7-6950X packed 10. This is because Broadwell DT featured what Intel calls Crystal Well, which was code for CPUs featuring EDRAM and was introduced with Haswell, though only in BGA form. In the case of the 5775C, we got the first socketed Crystal Well part, and it received a 128 megabyte EDRAM, which acted much like a level 4 cache. The intention of this EDRAM was to feed the iGPU with a lot more memory bandwidth, which would improve 3D graphics performance, but when not utilized by the iGPU, it could be used by the CPU as an additional cache level. Now, I did review the Core i7-5775C back in 2015, and found that it was able to beat AMD's best iGPU solutions of the time, in games, and sometimes by up to a 60% margin, though it did also cost at least three times more. Actually, pricing was always going to be a really big issue for any desktop CPU back in 2015 with an on-package 128 megabyte memory buffer, and the 5775C came in at $366 US. Well, that was the thousand unit pricing. And that was a price that Intel was likely to make a lot less margin on when compared to the $339.4770K from years prior. Now, given all my recent testing surrounding Intel's 10th generation core series, where I compared different L3 cache capacities with everything else equalized, such as core count, core frequency, memory frequency, and timings, a lot of you actually asked if it would be possible to go and test the Core i7-5775C and add it to the results. I've got to admit I was hesitant to do this at first because it's not exactly an apples to apples test and that was the intention of the original content. The 5775C uses slower DDR3 memory and clocking it up to 4.5 GHz was going to be an extremely difficult task. But given I'd already collected the data for the Core i3-10105F at 4.2 GHz, I thought if I could get the 5775C to the same frequency, that would be a really interesting comparison. 
Like the Core i3 model, the 5775C packs a 6 megabyte L3 cache, though of course uses much older cores, but it does also have the 128 megabyte L4 cache, and that'll be made available to the cores when using the Radeon RX 6900 XT. So just how good was the 5775C, and can it stand up to the more modern quad cores like the awkwardly named Core i3 10105F? To find out, I of course run a series of benchmarks, but before we get to that, a few quick test notes. Firstly, please be aware that the Core i3 10105F and Core i7 5775C run at a slight clock speed disadvantage when compared to the i5, i7 and i9 parts. This is because the highest stable frequency I could achieve with the 5775C was 4.2 GHz, and then the 10105F is locked at 4.2 GHz for the all-core frequency. For the 10th gen parts, I used the Gigabyte Z590 Aorus Extreme motherboard. I then clocked the 3K SKU CPUs at 4.5 GHz and used a 45 times multiplier for the ring bus, and also used DDR4320CL14 dual rank dual channel memory with all the primary, secondary, and tertiary timings manually configured. The Core i3-10105F used the same spec memory, but I was unable to adjust the clock frequency. The Core i7-5775C was tested on the ASUS Z97 Pro motherboard using the latest BIOS and some DDR3-2400-CL11-13-1331 memory. And then finally, for the graphics card, I used the Radeon RX 6900 XT as it is currently the fastest 1080p gaming graphics card on the market. Okay, let's check out the results. Starting with Rainbow Six Siege, the two results we really want to focus on here are those of the Core i3-10105F and the Core i7-5775C. The old 5th gen Core i7 using DDR3-2400 memory pushed the 6900XT to 325fps on average, which is quite an impressive result when you consider that the 10105F was just 10% faster and it enjoys the benefit of much faster DDR4-3200 memory along with numerous generations of core and architectural refinement. But what this means is, when matched with the same core count and operating frequency, we're looking at what is effectively just a 10% IPC improvement for Intel over a six year period when using Rainbow Six Siege as the measuring stick. That's a shockingly small improvement given this also includes an upgrade in memory technology. Of course, Intel has added more cores and cache since then, but if we stick with the four core configurations, we see that the 10600K is 22% faster, the 10700K is 31% faster, and the 10900K 37% faster. And of course, those margins do widen further once you enable all supported cores for those parts. The Assassin's Creed Valhalla data isn't terribly useful as the 10th gen parts are all heavily GPU limited, and this wasn't the case for the 5775C, which trailed the average frame rate result of the 10th gen Core i3 by 10%, and the 1% low by 12%. So it is difficult to make any real performance claims based on this data, so let's move on. The Battlefield 5 results are very interesting as here the 5775C wasn't a great deal slower than the 10105F, especially when looking at the average frame rate. When comparing the average frame rate, the fifth gen part was just 3% slower, but we saw a much larger 17% drop in performance for the 1% low, and I'd say this is largely down to the difference in memory and cache bandwidth, something that we will look at later on. Moving on to F1 2020, and here the 10th gen Core i3 really isn't offering much in the way of extra performance over the aging 5th gen 5775C. We're looking at just an 8% improvement in average frame rate performance with an 11% boost to the 1% lows. And here Intel's achieved its biggest performance gains over the years by simply adding more L3 cache, as seen with the 10600K. It's only a 13% performance uplift, but that's quite significant given that the 10105F and 10600K are based on the exact same CPU architecture. Now, Hitman is yet another game that shows very little progress for Intel over the past six years. The 10th gen Core i3 was just 5% faster than the 5775C, and again, it's the doubling of L3 cache that's led to the biggest performance improvement as the 10600K offered a 9% boost from the 10105F, and an 11% increase in 1% low performance. Next, we have Horizon Zero Dawn, and I suspect that memory bandwidth is at a premium here, as the 10th gen Core i3 was up to 12% faster and 14% faster when comparing the 1% low data. Again, not amazing progress after six years, but this is one of the bigger performance uplifts we've seen for 10th gen over 5th gen. 
We're also looking at an 11% increase in performance for the 10105F over the 5775C in Cyberpunk 2077. Then if we take what would be Intel's fastest quad core, the 10900K with its 20 megabyte L3 cache, we see with just four cores active that it's 24% faster than the 5775C. So a decent performance uplift there, but probably a lot less than what you would have expected to see after more than half a decade. Shadow of the Tomb Raider has always been rough on quad cores, even those with eight threads, and this is especially true in the village section that we use for testing. That said, with powerful enough cores, the experience can be quite good with a quad core, as seen with the 10600K, 10700K, and 10900K went limited to four cores. Then if we look at the 10105F, we see a 16% drop in 1% low performance from the 10600K, while the 5775C is a further 12% slower. So if we hone in on the 5775C and 10105F comparison, we see that over the last six years, Intel has improved performance here by up to 14%. Same we're looking at the 1% low data. Certainly not amazing, but it's also better than most other results that we've seen so far. And the last result we're going to look at comes from Watch Dogs Legion, and here the 10105F was 11% faster than the 5775C for the average frame rate, and 17% faster when looking at the 1% low data. So once again, not a huge or really even significant performance increase for what amounts to six generations of CPU releases. Now, before wrapping up the testing, here's a look at cache bandwidth. Also, please note that all 10th gen configurations enjoyed a memory bandwidth, so accessing system memory, of 38 gigabytes per second. So that's 38 gigabytes for the DDR4-3200 memory when measured using SciSoft Sandra 2021. And that is the memory bandwidth test within that application. So this is an A to 64, which will give you higher readouts. Also, please note that I haven't bothered providing a memory bandwidth graph because of the 11 tested configurations, we have just two different results. Again, for the 10th gen parts, it's 38 gigabytes per second. And that's regardless of the model or core count configuration. The Core i7-5775C on the other hand, that was limited to 30 gigabytes per second using DDR3-2400 memory. What this means is the newer 10th gen CPUs enjoyed a 27% increase in memory bandwidth. So quite a substantial advantage there. Then when looking at the cache bandwidth, there are a few interesting things to note here. Firstly, L1 and L2 is per core cache. So the bandwidth figure here is effectively multiplied by the core count. So really we're gonna get our best comparison here with four cores active, and here all 10th gen models are much the same. What we can see is that Intel managed to improve L1 cache bandwidth by 11% from the fifth gen architecture to the 10th gen. And then the L2 cache bandwidth by a much more substantial 55%. Then we saw a 33% improvement in L3 cache bandwidth when comparing the 5775C to the 10105F. So although the capacity is the same, the bandwidth has been radically improved. Finally, we see that while useful, the EDRAM, so the L4 cache bandwidth, it's not huge. And in fact, it's not much greater than the 10th gen models accessing system memory with a bandwidth of just 39 gigabytes per second. So around four times slower than the L3 cache of the 10105F. That probably explains why back in 2015, I found that the 5775C was only around 10% faster than the 4770K when comparing clock for clock performance in a range of applications. Obviously, having now been stuck on their 14 nanometer process for what seems like an infinite amount of pluses, Intel's progress over the years has been much slower than expected. In a way, it is very impressive to see just how much they've been able to squeeze out of the 14 nanometer process, while on the other hand, you'd normally expect to see significantly more progress six years later. If you had told me back in 2015 that by the year 2021, Intel's latest and greatest CPUs would be around 10% faster in games at the same core count and clock speed, I seriously doubt I would have believed you, especially given that back then I would have been using a GeForce GTX 980 Ti for benchmarking, whereas today we have a significantly faster 6900 XT. So really that should be highlighting any improvements in CPU performance. Moreover, if you'd also told me that AMD would be dominating Intel on the mainstream and even high-end desktop platforms, as well as the server market by 2021, I probably would have passed out from laughter. So definitely don't listen to my long-term predictions, not that I make them, but if I do, Alt F4. Now, to be fair on Intel, they have made some good steps forward from the fifth gen Core i7 by adding some more cores. And while that has seen power usage skyrocket, 
so too has performance, and I guess the price. Uh, certainly not as much as Intel would have liked, but the 10900K and 11900K are much faster than the 5775C. There are also much bigger dies, especially the 11900K, but as I've noted numerous times now, that's because they use the same 14 nanometer process, or at least a variation of it. So anyway, that's how the Core i7-5775C compares against the more modern 10th gen models. And I've got to say, it holds up really well. I mean, it is overclocked in this test. We are trying to do a clock for clock comparison, but it holds up pretty well. And especially when looking from within a four core bubble. Having said that, I don't think the L4 cache is nearly as handy as some of you think it is at least not for CPU related performance anyway. It's certainly very handy for GPU performance, which would otherwise be heavily limited by the bandwidth of the PCI Express 3.0 bus. And if that is going to do it for this kind of strange look back at the Core i7-5775C. If you enjoyed this for science type video, then please do hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe for more content. Also, if you'd like to join the Harbour Unbox community, become a member, you can join us over at Floatplane or Patreon. Links for those are in the video description. You'll get access to our exclusive Discord server where you can chat with Tim and myself. Tim and myself also do a monthly live stream where you can chat with us there live and we talk about whatever interesting topics have come up during that month. Uh, we also have behind the scenes content, Q&A's, a lot of cool stuff there, so yeah, if you're interested, check it out. If not, perfectly fine, and I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.